Hello and welcome to the section on non-quadratic regularizers. So remember the idea of regularization. We want to choose a theta which both minimizes the empirical risk and also makes the predictor be not too sensitive. So if I've got an x near an x tilde, then we'd like g theta of x to also be close to g theta of x tilde. And the reason for this reduction in sensitivity that we're going to put in there is that if you make the predictor too sensitive, then what happens is you end up with something that doesn't generalize well. And so this is a way of forcing the predictor to be insensitive to the data. And that makes the predictor generalized better. It's a way of preventing overfitting. And so what we do in order to achieve this is we use a regularizer, a function r, which is a function of the parameters theta, and it's a real valued function of r, which measures the sensitivity of g theta, so that in particular when theta is large, then our function, our regularizer function, is also large, and so by making the regularizer small, we'll make theta small, and thereby we'll make the sensitivity of g theta small. There's another way to think about this, and this is very common in the statistical literature from the statistical viewpoint, and that is that the regularizer is encoding some prior information we have about theta, specifically that the regularized r of theta is actually small. And so this is a way of saying, well, we believe that the theta that generalizes, uh, that, that corresponds to the true predictor underlying the data, the true model of the data has a small theta. And so we're going to enforce that in our learning algorithm, we only look at thetas that are actually small. And that's a completely uh, a uh, different way of looking at uh, the purpose of the regularizer, but it's equally valid. Uh, in, in both cases, you want both the empirical risk L of theta and the regularizer R of theta to be small. So regularized empirical risk minimization. We choose theta to minimize the empirical risk L of theta plus some positive constant lambda multiplied by r of theta, the regularizer. And remember, lambda here is called the regularization hyperparameter, which we can trade off L of theta against r of theta. And we choose it by validating against data in a separate set called the test set. And the, the trick of all of this, of course, is that this actually works. It works in the sense that by enforcing regularization, we end up with worse performance on the training set, but better performance on, on the test set, and it's test set performance that we actually care about. Now, when you're constructing regularizers, we've seen so far the two norm used as a regularizer in ridge regression, and a very common format for regularizers is to have uh, a penalty function q, which is a function which maps the real numbers to the real numbers, and the regularizer of theta is simply q of theta 1 plus q of theta 2 all the way up to all of our parameters theta p. And so we penalize each of the parameters, each of the components of theta separately and add up the corresponding penalizations. And normally we choose these penalty functions q such that they're non-negative and so that they're only zero when theta i is zero. And q of theta i is therefore expressing our displeasure in choosing the predictor coefficient theta i and in particular by defining it so that it increases with the value of theta i, it expresses the fact that we prefer small theta i's of a large theta rise. And so we've seen the case where we have q of theta i is just theta i squared. That's the sum of square regularizer or ridge regression. It's also called the quadratic regularizer, the Tikhonov regularizer, or the L2 regularizer. 
That's the q square function. It's just q square of a is a squared. And with that penalty function, then the regularizer is just the norm of theta squared. And in particular, it's the two norm of theta squared. Another very common regularizer is the sum absolute function, um, where the penalty function that we're using is q abs, the absolute value function. And that way, the regularizer function r of theta is the sum of the absolute values of the components of theta. That's called the one norm of the vector theta. Um, people would call that sum absolute regularization or L1 regularization or lasso regularization. Uh, another one we might see is the non-negative regularizer um, where the penalty function is zero when A is greater than or equal to zero and it's infinity when A is less than zero. And that's a very hard penalty. It says that the only thetas that we will accept are thetas for which all of the components of theta are greater than or equal to zero. So in other words, we're enforcing the fact that the predictor coefficients have to be non-negative. And any minimizer which minimizes L of theta plus R of theta, where R has this form, the only way you can have a minimizer is if the resulting theta is uh, no negative. Now let's uh, uh, look at this in the context of sensitivity and uh, suppose we've got uh, uh, a linear predictor g theta of x which is theta transpose x and this here is uh, uh, we're predicting a scalar y and we'll suppose that the feature vector x changes to x tilde, which is x plus some delta. And delta here is the perturbation or change in x. And we'll assume for now that any delta uh, is possible, but we're going to look at the set of uh, perturbations, capital delta, and uh, we're only going to allow perturbations, little delta, that live in this capital delta set. We'll call it the feature perturbation set. And um, we can say, well, suppose theta is a predictor parameter and x now changes to x plus delta. What happens to our prediction? In that case, the prediction becomes theta transpose multiplied by x plus delta. And so the change in the prediction is going to be theta transpose x delta minus theta transpose x, which is just going to be theta transpose delta. So if we look at the absolute value of that quantity, the absolute value of theta transpose delta, that's the magnitude of the change in prediction. And we can ask ourselves, well, how big can this be when we're allowing delta to range in some set capital delta? And we can look at the worst case sensitivity, the maximum over all deltas in capital delta of the absolute value of theta transpose delta. This is a measure of sensitivity. If we, for some specific set capital delta, then we can say, well, this quantity tells us how much the prediction can change in the worst case. So let's look at the case where we're looking at L2 perturbations. In other words, we're looking at the script, the set capital delta to be the set of all perturbations little delta with two norm less than or equal to epsilon. Epsilon is some number and this is a ball. This is a, a sphere in uh, delta space. So the set of deltas which are in capital delta is a sphere. Capital delta is a sphere. And this is called an L2 ball. And this means that the feature vector x can change to any x tilde 
within distance epsilon, and in particular we're measuring distance with the two norm. Now, as we've seen before, the cauchy schwarz inequality tells us that the absolute value of theta transpose delta is less than or equal to the two norm of theta multiplied by the two norm of delta. And the two norm of delta we know has to be less than or equal to epsilon for all deltas in our allowed set. And that means that the absolute value of theta transpose delta is less than or equal to epsilon times the two norm of theta. So in particular, the worst case sensitivity is therefore epsilon times the two norm of theta. And maximizing the change in the prediction out of all possible deltas that we're allowed to choose, the one that maximizes the change in the prediction is um, epsilon divided by the two norm of theta times theta. In other words, we take theta and we normalize that vector and multiply it by epsilon. And so this is a justification for the sum of square regularization. If we are concerned about minimizing the worst case sensitivity to changes in x which are in a unit L2 ball, then the sum of square regularizer measures exactly that. It measures how badly, how much can the prediction change when we know that x can only change by an amount epsilon in distance. Now that's a way of interpreting the purpose of L2 regularization. It's, uh, it says what you're doing is you're minimizing the worst case response to a particular class of perturbations. Now if we look at the L infinity perturbation class instead, well then we'll get a different appropriate choice of regularizer. So the L infinity class of perturbations, that's the allowed set of deltas, the allowed set of changes to x, which for which each of the components delta i has absolute value less than or equal to epsilon. So people call that an L infinity ball, but of course really it's just a cube. People might call it a hypercube in d dimensions. So capital delta here is a cube and we're saying that you can take an x and perturb it by a vector which is in this cube and the, the widths of the sides of this cube are 2 epsilon. Uh, and the reason it's called an L infinity ball is that it has exactly the same form as the, the usual ball. It's the norm of delta is less than or equal to epsilon is the defining characteristic of this ball. But here the norm is a different norm. Instead of being the two norm, it's the infinity norm. And the infinity norm of a vector delta is the maximum of the absolute value of the components of delta. So this is a very complicated way of de defining a cube in terms of a norm. Um, so this means any component of the feature vector can change by up to epsilon. So instead of saying we're going to ch uh, think about changes to x as being changes to the vector x and they all live in the sphere and if you're going to have changes in the sphere it means if you change a lot in one direction then you can't change very much in any other direction. Here we're saying you can change all of the components separately and you can change all of those components by up to epsilon. And with that kind of model how big can the absolute value of theta transpose delta be? Um, now there's a way of maximizing the change in the absolute value of theta transpose delta when delta is required to be in a cube. And the idea is, is that you take the thetas and you choose your deltas to be epsilon times the sine of the thetas. So if theta i is positive, then you'll choose delta i to be epsilon, 
and if theta i is negative, then you'll choose delta i to be minus epsilon. And if you do that, then what you get is that the change in the prediction, theta transpose times delta, well, that becomes theta transpose times sine of theta, where sine of theta is applied element-wise to the vector theta, or multiplied by epsilon. And that becomes epsilon times the sum of the absolute values of theta, which is epsilon times the one norm of theta. In other words, if x is allowed to change by any change any component by epsilon, possibly all of the components, by up to epsilon, the worst case change you're going to have in theta transpose x is epsilon times the sum of the absolute values of the theta i's. And if you're concerned about those kinds of perturbations happening to x, then your regularizer that you should choose is the sum of the absolute regularizer. So R of theta should be the one norm of theta, which is the sum of the absolute values of theta i. Now this is all well and good. This is a, an, an analysis of what it means to penalize this particular, these particular regularizers. Um, it, it's important not to take this too far or too seriously. This is a, it certainly gives us a way of interpreting the meaning of choosing these particular regularizations, but it doesn't give us a way of choosing which one we should apply in a particular machine learning problem. The way we would do that is, well, there's two ways. One is that we gain some experience with a wide range of machine learning problems. And we see that for some types of machine learning problems, the two norm regularizer tends to do better. And for other types of machine learning problems, the one norm regularizer tends to do better. And we'll have something to say along those lines in this section. The other way is even more pragmatic and that is to say, validate. You want to know which one's better? Try both of them. Compute the performance, compute the empirical risk on your test set, and see which one did better. So, we have now uh, two types of regularization that we're going to focus on. One is two-norm regularization, and if our, we're using the square loss, remember, which is L of y hat y is the square of y hat minus y, again, when y is scalar. Then if you choose theta to minimize L of theta plus lambda times the two-norm of theta squared, that's called ridge regression. The other one we'll focus on is where we're using the one-norm of theta as our regressor. And then we're going to be minimizing empirical risk plus lambda times the one norm of theta. And that's called lasso regression. Uh, this was invented at Stanford by Rob Tipshirani in 1994. And lasso regularization, lasso regression is actually widely used in advanced machine learning. Um, we saw for ridge regression that even though it looks like an extension of least squares, the problem actually reduces to a least squares problem when we can apply the least squares formula to solve explicitly for the optimal theta. Um, Lasso regression doesn't have a formula. There is no analytical expression. There is no algebraic expression for the theta that minimizes the regularized empirical risk when the regularizer is the one norm. When the predictor is linear, then if we're using square loss, 
both ridge regression and lasso regression can be efficiently computed. For ridge regression, there's a formula. For lasso regression, we have to use numerical optimization. But these numerical optimization methods are extremely efficient and always converge to the global optimal solution because the problem is convex. Now when we have a constant feature, so we have x1 is 1, the predictor coefficient theta1 is the offset, again when the predictor is linear. So in that case we have g theta of x is theta1 plus theta2 x2 and so x1 doesn't change even when uh, x changes. Um, we do not consider perturbations to x1 because x1 is the constant feature. So delta1 is always considered to be zero. As a result, theta1 does not contribute to predictor sensitivity. And as a result, we do not regularize the associated coefficient theta1. And so we modify both regularizers to only include terms from theta2 through d, theta d. We either take the 2 norm of theta2 through theta d or the 1 norm of theta2 through theta d. Now, there's a specific property of certain regularizers which is very useful, and that's to do with sparseness. So if I have a linear predictor, g theta of x is theta transpose x, well, if theta is sparse, sparse here means that many of the entries of theta are zero. So the number of non-zero components of theta is small compared to the length of theta then um, as a result the prediction theta transpose x doesn't depend on some of the features x. In particular it doesn't depend on those features xi for which theta i is zero. Um, it means that well if I've got a predictor that only uses some features rather than thinking about it as g theta of all of x I can think about it as g theta of just those particular components of x, those with which theta i is non-zero. And this can have practical benefits. Um, uh, in particular, um, you can make the predictor simpler to interpret. Instead of having a prediction as to somebody's illness based on a thousand different measured properties and diagnostic tests, we might have a prediction which is actually only depends on a few and that can be much more useful. It's also much cheaper if I want to decide that I'm going to try and diagnose somebody's health using such an algorithm. If I only have to run four or five blood tests rather than 50 or 60, that's a huge savings. Um, so the predictor is simpler to interpret, it's cheaper to actually execute, um, and you can actually get better performance. Uh, this happens when some of the components xi, some of the regressors, are actually irrelevant. So imagine we're in a situation where we've got y and we've got x, and some of the components of x actually don't affect y at all. You know, we might be trying to uh, fit house price, and we've got various components of x, such as a lot area, lot size, number of bedrooms, but we've also got components of x, such as the current weather in Barcelona, which may be totally irrelevant to the house price in Mountain View. Um, even if it's irrelevant, our learning algorithm may assign that regressor, that component, a non-zero theta because it achieves slightly better performance on the training set with a non-zero theta than uh, it does with a zero theta. Uh, 
And uh, ah, that's totally reasonable and that's exactly what will typically happen. The learning algorithm can't tell the difference between components of the variables x, which are just noise, and components which are actually meaningful. If choosing non-zero components makes the empirical risk smaller, that's what it'll do. Um, but of course, it's total nonsense from a practical perspective. We've got a, a predictor that we know is fitting the wrong thing. Um, and so if we could somehow remove those irrelevant regressors, then we might, if not achieve better training loss, which we won't do, but we might achieve better test loss. And so by, if we can somehow induce sparsity in our linear predictor, if we can induce sparsity in a linear predictor, then it may enable us to remove those components of theta, which don't really matter, but just happen to be correlated the right way with the training data. This idea that we're going to choose the sparsity pattern of theta is called feature selection. And there are several different ways of carrying it out. One in particular is, called, is to use L1 regularization. And it is a, an important property of L1 regularization that it leads to sparse coefficient vectors. In other words, if we use R of theta as the one norm of theta, and we minimize empirical risk plus lambda times the one norm of theta, as a consequence of that structure, that the structure of that optimization problem, we will tend to produce thetas that are sparse. So one explanation for this, when we're using a square penalty, well, once you've made theta small, theta squared is really very small. And so the incentive for the sum of squares regularizer to make a coefficient smaller decreases once theta has already become small. For the absolute penalty, that doesn't happen. Once um, theta becomes small, well, it, it, theta squared may become very small, but the absolute value of theta doesn't necessarily become very small. It just has the same scale as theta. And so the incentive to make theta small continues until theta is actually zero. Of course, that's a very rough explanation. Uh, one can do a more sophisticated mathematical analysis to show that in fact, the one norm of theta produces sparse thetas when one uses the one norm as a regularization. Uh, we're not going to do that in this class, but we will see it in practice. So here's an example. On the left-hand side, we have ridge regression, and on the right-hand side, we have lasso regression. And so the left-hand two plots are the usual regularization path plots that we make. Here we have the test loss, which increases as a function of lambda. And we have the training loss. And in this case, we see that the training loss also increases with lambda. We might sometimes get a small dip in the test loss. We also see in the bottom plot the usual shrinkage. We see the magnitude of theta in the size of the various components of theta at a particular value of lambda. And we see that those numbers get smaller as we increase theta, as we increase lambda. Now in the right hand side we have the same plots but for lasso when we're using L1 regularization. And here we can see very similar training loss. One noticeable feature is that there's a sharp corner there and that's a characteristic feature of um, 
lasso regression. We also see that the test loss has a much more marked dip with a significantly smaller test loss than in the L2 regularized case. Um, now, why is this? And the reason is, is that the lasso regression is eliminating the irrelevant features. Let's look at the regularization path for theta. What you can see is that as we increase lambda, the components of theta tend to zero. And they tend to zero and hit zero exactly and then stay there. And they hit zero exactly at a particular value of lambda. And each one of them will hit um, uh, uh, lambda one after the other and uh, eventually we'll end up with a completely zero, exactly zero predictor, which will be in this case for lambda here, which is a little bit larger than one. For lambda a little bit smaller than one, we have a predictor that consists of two non-zero components of theta. And back here, we have three. And once we're back to here, we have maybe 20 non-zero components of theta. And this sudden hitting of zero exactly is what causes the sharp corner in the loss path as well. And so the lasso regression is selecting features for us. It's selecting those features which are relevant to the training problem. And it's removing those features which are irrelevant, and it's removing them exactly. Now, because they are, the features that are removed are irrelevant, they're simply noise, um, fitting them to the training data may improve training loss, but it will have the downside that it will inherently make the test loss worse. And that's why we see such a distinction between the lasso test loss and the ridge test loss. Here are the results. So on the top we have ridge regression with the square regularizer and on the bottom plot we have lasso regularization with the absolute regularizer. The, on the top we can see that this is so this is a plot of the components of theta uh, sorted and so first of all we take the components of theta, we take their absolute value and then we plot the sorted absolute values. And you can see that for the Tikhonov regularization that all 200 of the components of theta are non-zero and as we go down the list they decay but rather slowly. Every one of those X's is being used in some way or another to predict Y. For lasso, at this particular optimal lambda, only the first 35 components of theta are non-zero. The other 165 components are exactly zero. And so we have a predictor which doesn't use in any way 165 components of X, which are the irrelevant components of X. Now, after we've trained with lasso, we can pick a particular lambda where we've only got a few components left, which are non-zero. So we've done feature selection to select the features that are most important. So here we've looked at the lambda where we've reduced the predictor to only using seven features. And if we look back at our plot that is somewhere here, 
there's some cutoff lambda value at which there's only seven non-zero components of theta left. And then what we can do is we can retrain. We can take all of our x's, cut off all of the components of x for which the corresponding theta that we have has a zero entry. And as a result, our x's will reduce from being 200 dimensional to being only seven dimensional in this case. And then with a seven dimensional x, we can retrain using either Tikhonov regression or lasso regression. And what do we see? We see on the left here, we see Ridge or Tikhonov, and on the right here, we see lasso. Uh, we see on the left for the plots of theta that we're seeing the usual shrinkage as we increase lambda. And on the right, we're seeing lasso star shrinkage where the components are going down to touch zero exactly. However, the key thing about these two plots is that if we look at the test loss. In both plots, we're getting test loss, which is similar. And that's because feature selection has happened. And what we have now is um, only those features, those components of X, which are relevant to the problem we're trying to solve, which are relevant to Y. And as a result, Blasso has no components to remove which won't affect the test loss you know, in a significant way. And uh, Conversely, ridge regression has no extra components to use, which it can count to, which it would normally use to overfit. Now, the sparsification property of um, the one norm uh, can be strengthened. So remember what these regularizers look like. If we plot them, then so this will be a component of theta, and this will be the absolute value. Um, or we can look at the component of theta and look at the square. Now, if we want to make this a sharper corner here, then we would have a stronger sparsifier. One way we might make it a sharper corner is to replace the penalty function with a penalty function that does this. Now, as a result, we've got an even greater incentive on regularized empirical risk minimization to make the components of theta exactly zero. Some people would call this the L one half regularizer. That is a little bit of a misnomer because the the the, the, the nomenclature L P refers to a, the P norm, and so um, if I use P as a half, then that that says I'm using the one half norm, and it turns out that that quantity, which should be defined as the sum of i of theta i absolute value to the one half or squared is not actually a norm. It doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality. And so um, we tend to avoid calling this the L one half regularizer. Uh, this is a stronger sparsifier. It, uh, it's not convex, however, and as a result, uh, uh, algorithms to compute this may not work as well as the one norm or two norm regularizers. Here's an example. On the left we have the plots for ridge regression. In the middle we have plots for lasso or L1 regression. And on the right we have an example computed with the square root regularizer. And we can see that we're getting some very similar behavior for the square root regularizer as we do for the absolute value regularizer where we're getting exact 
sparsification. And some, as we increase lambda, some of the components of theta go to zero exactly. Now let's have one more look at one more regularizer. This is the non-negative regularizer. Um, so sometimes we know or require that theta i should be greater than or equal to zero. So when x i increases, so must our prediction. Um, and that means that we'd like to impose the constraint that theta i is greater than or equal to zero on the empirical risk minimization. One way to do this is to have a regularizer which charges a cost to the in the objective function which is infinite when theta i is negative and is zero when theta i is non-negative. Um, so you might have this for example if your target variable is lifespan and x measures healthy behavior. Um, People would call this non-negative least squares if you're doing quadratic loss. Um, so one, one way of solving these kinds of problems uh, is um, to solve the least squares problem for a theta and then say, okay, well, I've got a, least, a theta which uh, minimizes the square loss, solves empirical risk minimization. And I'm going to take that theta and any components of it which are negative, I'm going to set to zero. We might write that as theta ls plus. Um, it turns out that doesn't work very well um, because the minimization has been done without any knowledge of the constraint that the components of theta have to be non-negative. And the negative components that we've set to zero might actually be very important. Um, it's much better to actually impose it as a regularization term on the, uh, on the minimization problem and solve the minimization knowing that we would like theta to have non-negative components. Here's a specific example. Here we have a, a one-dimensional u and a one-dimensional v. We've set y equal to v and we've constructed features from u. The features are 1, the constant feature, u, and then u minus 0 0.2 plus. Remember what that is, u plus, u minus 0 0.2 plus. Um, if I plot that, this will be u, and this is going to be u minus a plus. This is the point A, and this is the function. And so it, 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 the resulting predictor is going to be piecewise linear, and uh, it's going to have kinks in it at these points, 0 0.2, we've got 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, in this list here. And so we're going to have a piecewise linear predictor. Now if we want, th th if we're going to impose the constraint that theta i be non-negative, well what does the predictor look like? The predictor looks like y hat is theta 1 plus theta 2 u plus theta 3 u minus 0 0.2 plus, plus theta 4, u minus 0 0.4 plus, and so on. So if the thetas are non-negative, well, it means that theta 1 is non-negative. So at 0, the function y hat has to be positive. It means that theta 2 is non-negative, which means that when u is less than 0.2, the function is just theta 1 plus theta 2 u, 
And so that has to have uh, a non-negative slope. So if we look at this predictor between the values of u is 0.2 and, the val and u is 0.4, then we find that the slope in that region is theta 2 plus theta 3. Because both theta 2 and theta 3 are non-negative, that slope is greater than or equal to the slope at, at between 0 and 0 0.2, which is just theta 2. So all of the thetas being non-negative means that the function must be non-decreasing, and it must be convex. As we increase u, the slope has to increase. Um, so here's a data set, and here's the predictor. Here is the predictor. It's this is the optimal non-negative least squares fit, where we've used a non-negative regularizer and uh, um, and we can see that the, the function indeed is convex and non-decreasing. This is the optimal least squares fit. Certainly piecewise linear has to be, it's convex, but it's not non-decreasing. Now, if we use our heuristic and we say, well, we'll get, what we're going to do is we're going to take that theta and simply adjust it so that all of the components of theta are non-negative. Non In particular here, we see that theta 2 is less than zero, and so we change this function to make, by making theta two equal to zero. Then we end up with a function that looks like this. And that uh, is an extremely poor fit to the data. We can see here that the non-negative least squares loss is 0 0.59. The least squares loss, of course, does better because it doesn't have the constraint that the coefficients be non-negative, and so it does better with 0.3. But the heuristic loss is 15 because the data, the, this uh, approach, uh, this heuristic, is not guaranteed to work. So the message here is that simply taking the least squares predictor and truncating it can perform very badly indeed. Much better to use a non-negative regularizer. Let's summarize. You want to choose a regularizer? Ultimately, the thing you have to do is use validation. If you've got a choice between two different regularizers that you have in mind, say L1 and L2, try them both and see, one, see which one gives you the best test loss. Um, and the way we do that, well, we know is that um, we choose a range of lambdas we do RERM, regularized empirical risk minimization, of each one to compute a predictor, and then we take those predictors, we evaluate them on the test set, and then we choose the lambda that gives the best test error. That tells you the, vari the variation of the test performance as a function of lambda. Now we're going to do that with each of our different regularizers, and we'll use the regularizer that gives the best test error. Uh, beyond that, we've talked a little bit about um, some situations in which one might expect lasso to perform better than ridge regression. And in particular, the situation that's most common is when there are irrelevant features in your data. Um, We've seen also that the importance of getting rid of those features can be very significant. If it costs you a lot to collect data, then getting rid of some unwanted data can be a really useful thing to do to save you having to collect the data for future tests. Um, ultimately, though, it's important not to believe that one can a priori determine which regularizer to use. You have to determine it based on validation.